My name is Betsy Cooper, Director of the University of Washington Dance Program. Welcome to UW Dance Presents Chamber Dance Company. In previous episodes, we looked at the burgeoning modern dance movement in the United States. The ideas and social movements that spurred the new dance were also occurring throughout Central Europe. In Germany, Mary Wigmann, under the tutelage of the great dance theorist Rudolf von Laban, embarked on her own quest to find a way of moving that was contemporary, deeply personal, and emotionally potent. Wigmann became the leading figure of Ausdruckstanz, which can be loosely translated to expressive dance. Ausdruckstanz gave primacy to individual expression as a means to connect to humanity and the cosmos. And like expressive dance as practiced in America, its proponents sought a way to live harmoniously, despite the ills of industrialization and urbanization on modern society. In its earliest stages of development, dancers blur traditional boundaries between performance and experience, between theater and nature, and between dance and ritual. Wigmann's approach shunned codified movement and traditional musical accompaniment. She created from improvisation the physical embodiment of rhythm and a deeply intentional relationship to the space inhabited by the dancer. Wigmann had an interest in mysticism and the occult, which is in evidence in her solo Witch Dance from 1926.
the solo cycle Schwingende Landschaft, Shifting Landscape, premiered in 1929. Wigman's contemporaries observed a distinct representational shift in these dances. She no longer danced as an abstraction of pure emotion. Instead, these solos revealed a heightened attention to form. An identifiable female persona had emerged. We know that Wigman created these solos while she was in the midst of a summer love affair.
Dance is the most ephemeral of the arts because our traditions are kinesthetically based and subject to individual interpretation and memory. Dances are passed on in the studio, body to body, from one generation to the next. If one is fortunate, the originator of the movement is present, but this is often not the case. The Vigmon dances performed by Chamber Dance Company were reconstructed by University of Hawaii professor Betsy Fisher. Her quest to excavate Vigmon's early dances involved extensive detective work and led her on a fascinating journey. Mary Vigmon was a star. She was amazing because she could have a career in dance bridging incredible political and social and world change. So she um, worked through the Weimar period, that tremendous social period of ups and downs economically and socially in all sorts of ways. And then she was able to work through a good deal of the Third Reich through World War II. And she was declared sort of degenerate or wasn't able to work for a period at the end there. But then she picked up her career after and was able to work after as well. So it's quite incredible that she could do that. She had an incredible following. Her schools were monstrously successful for most of that time. And uh, I mean, she suffered a great deal during World War II, as did everyone. Um, and people came from all over the world to study with her. So this um, dispersal of her ideas as they as they were as they were nurtured by other artists of that time went went everywhere Japan even Korea I've heard China certainly throughout Europe um, and certainly into the United States and Canada Australia New Zealand for various reasons people had studied with her and went to different places talk to us a little bit about how Wigman, um played a role just in German expressionist dance there was an incredible excitement about, not just in Germany, but a lot of places. And, and I think this had to do somewhat with the, with the kind of awakening of, of female body, so to speak. But everybody got more sort of corporally um, aware. And this body culture, they called it, really, really started to come up, not just in Germany, but certainly in the United States, you know, where you know, women were shortening the, their dresses so they wouldn't drag around in the muck and playing tennis and bicycling. And, and in Germany, um, this, this happened, and, and there were these great rhythmic gymnastics that were going on. And um, uh, so people were interested in this kind of health and fitness mm -hmm. and body and, and moving together in these exercises. So that's kind of interesting that that whole thing was going on. Um, and of course, Del Croze was beginning his teaching, which you're probably familiar with, um, combining music and expression and physical body, right? So this was very fertile time. And uh, Rudolf von Laban was a very uh, important uh, movement theorist at that time. And Wigmann had studied with Laban and became closely associated with Laban. He was very scientific in his approach and his look at space and his whole theory of icosahedron and uh, uh, theories that are still being developed today. Um, not just Laban notation, but mo theories of, of movement. And she got more into the, the, the mystical, spiritual quest, yeah, where she, uh, so she, she brought into this expression dance. And this is the Ausdruckstanz, expression dance. I think many of her works certainly were expressionistic, but um, it, it could be considered that expressionism is a part of Ausdruckstanz, but not the total. The dances are quite different, and artists hopefully do have a range. I mean, that's, that's what we love to do. Yeah, you're an artist as well. Um, so keeping within the same pocket all the time wouldn't be very interesting. However, there are several things that are similar and between the two dances. And um, one of them has to do with this um, interest in, in mysticism, in uh, a, a desire to, to have a communion with something else, you know, with this kind of uh, spiritual life force. And I'm trying to recall a quote from Wigmann. It's something to the effect of the dancer belongs to the earth and flings 
herself or himself to the heavens to, in, in, a, in a, a desire for this kind of communion or this kind of communication. And in, in the Hexentons, this, this happens in a way uh, with an interest perhaps more towards the occult or towards a ritualistic kind of uh, rhythm and power. Uh, in Schwing in the Landschaft, of course, excuse me, in Swinging Landscapes, it's quite different uh, physically. But if you think of it that way, it's thematically, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's more similar. So that's, that's part, of, part of it. Structurally, uh, they're also quite similar. Um, in Hexentanz, the dancer starts in the middle of the stage, does some things, <laughs> moves around, ends up in the middle of the stage. And um, the, from, there's no, of course, uh, recording of the, entire Hexent of the entire witch dance. But from what we see on the little bit that remains, and from uh, things that have been written about original performances, um, that's what happens. Structurally, she stays, gets up, does, starts in the middle, gets up. And in each one from the swinging landscapes that remain, the three of the not, the original cycle was nine, right? The three that remain, each one starts in the middle, mm. gets up, moves around, comes back in the middle. So structurally, there's, there's similarities as well. When Mary Wigman choreographed the original witch dancer, Hexentanz, she, she writes in her book that she, she had bought some really ex extravagant fabric that was very expensive, a silk brocade. And she'd put it away. She was kind of guilty about having spent so much money on that thing. And one night, she got up, you know, and she looked, caught a glimpse of herself in the mirror, and her hair was all wild, and she was, and she had this sudden inspiration of this this witch, and she went and found that fabric and put it on, and thus was born the witch dance. So, she had this uh, wild sort of notion to start that piece, and and she also was very um, wrote and and apparently said many times that she didn't feel that dancers should ever copy. They should make their own. So I thought, well, in, make, in, in recreating the, the witch dance, that I should not copy, nor could I, because not much is left, but find it in myself. Hmm. Because that's what she was doing. She was right. finding it in herself. So I thought, well, okay, well, what is that thing? You know, what is that, that wild notion that she had, bam, to... To, to make that kinetic uh, statement, to, to make that rushing out into space and that clawing into, at the air, and, and what was that about, and how can I find that? We have to talk about the mask. It's yeah. pretty central to the piece. Absolutely. Original mask was created by, um, uh, I can't remember his name, but he had studied no ah. mask making. And um, so there's a very strong influence of a Japanese theater classical theater. Mask, for me, is a, a, an amplification. It's definitely not something you hide behind and allow to speak. I mean, it does speak, but you have to charge, charge that mask. You charge it, that mask, with something, and that mask then takes on a, takes on a spirit, and it becomes, a, it, it really has its life. The mask has its life, and, but that life comes from how the performer charges it, like a battery. You mentioned, uh, again, Swinging Landscape, uh, the dance from 1929. Let's talk about that again. Looking at it recently, I was struck with how sensual yeah. it is. In all the best ways we might think of that word, what was going on with Vigman at the time, or is there... You talked about, a, of course, an artist being able to have many notes, many aspects. Um, is there anything particular that fed into that dance? She apparently had fallen in love. Oh, she fell in love with a gentleman who I think was younger than she by perhaps as much as seven years. And um, she choreographed this piece as a kind of thinking about that summer where she was having this fabulous romantic relationship and it's it's got this it's to a tango you know and she's cause she's got all that but the dances are they may seem quite light 
And they are in a certain way, but they also are very uh, telling about her use of space and gesture, particularly in hands and forearms, and also in her concept of weight placement. Nowadays, everybody says, where's your center of weight? Everyone knows their center of weight's in their pelvis, right? Well, that's not, that's always the case. I mean, Isadora Duncan put it at the solar plexus, and Mary Wigman felt it was in the sternum. So, for instance, in Pastoral, where she, she does these gestures out, it's, it's a sense that the center of the being is, is more up here. And in, um, yeah, same in Pastoral when she does the leg gestures, um, near the heart. Well, yeah, and the legs are somehow, they're not, when you think of your power base being lower in your body, the leg functions differently. When the power base is higher in the body, it's, it's just a different thing. So it, as a performer, that makes it really interesting to do. I mean, you just put your whole placement in a different way. That, very difficult in a way, you know. Also, her use of hands in all three, the, the seraphic song, Pastoral, Dance of Summer, if, it could just seem light and flowy, but it, it, it's actually, there's a sense of kind of carving the whole time that she's doing it. Um, carving and this kind of inner tension going on in the, this part of the, the hands. And it's very particular and very specific to her way of, of, doing, of doing things. So it's, it, the, the piece is certainly in mood, uh, very lyric and sensual. But those things aren't to be taken as, you know, dance light. <laughs> but that it's a, they're inroads to a, a, a deep part of her aesthetic. And technique. Or even emotion light. Yeah. And watching you do it, I'm reminded again about the combination of the freedom and restraint mm -hmm. that she somehow got in the exact same moment, in that, a way. And I that's a more mature love, I would think. Yeah, and freedom and restraint, that's a wonderful way of putting it. It's a wonderful couplet. The award-winning UW Dance Program is home to Chamber Dance Company, whose mission is to present and archive modern dance works of historic and artistic significance for future generations. Tune in next time for more Chamber Dance Company performances here on UW-TV.